Good morning. Welcome to Parkville Presbyterian Church, a place where everyone is loved and everyone belongs. Whether you are here online or here in person, we are glad that you're here and part of our circle today. We want to lift up that this is the season of Easter. Easter is a season that lasts from Easter Sunday until Pentecost Sunday. It's a time of lifting up the reality that Christ has lived, Christ has died, Christ is risen. And so with Christ, we continue to live, we continue to breathe, we continue to be a body of Christ together that is rising together and embodying the life of Christ with one another. There are many ways that we live out the life of Christ with each other. A uh, few of them I wish to celebrate. Last Sunday, there was here in this space the Northland Community Choir concert, Death, Hope, and Happiness. Um, it was a bustling time. The Sanctuary had a feeling of fullness to it. There was a real sense of joy of the arts returning to our community. And so we praise God for being able to host that event and being able to be part of that reclamation of things that are happening here at Parkville. If you missed it, you can watch it on the church's Facebook page at facebook.com slash Parkville Presby. I want to also lift up that we had our Parkville Living Center break time event on Friday. Uh, Parkville Living Center break time happens on the third Friday of every month. It's a time where we gather for dinner, we gather for fellowship, we gather and play board games with one another. It's a time of really celebrating the gift of community with each other. And so we hope that you'll circle your calendar for the next third Friday of the month. There's free dinner, free child care. Um, it's a really fantastic event. Um, I want to call forward Linda Myers. Um, Linda is going to be telling us about a special offering that we'll be collecting on Pentecost Sunday. Uh, one of the things that we do together as a church is that we live in mission with each other. And so our mission team does a wonderful job of organizing mission for us and helping us to give collectively toward the, those efforts that the wider church sponsors and allows us to be a part of. morning. Uh, this year's Pentecost offering helps the church encourage, develop, and support its young people and also address, addresses the needs of at-risk children. 40% of the Pentecost offering can be retained by individual congregations wanting to make an impact in the lives of young people in their own community. The remaining 60% is used to support children at risk, youth and young adults through ministries of the Presbyterian Mission Agency. The PPC mission team has selected La Paz House, one of the missions of Grandview Park Presbyterian Church, serving the Latino community as the recipient of this year's local portion of the offering in support of at-risk children and youth in our community. La Paz House After School Program is designed to provide a safe, caring environment for the community's young people to grow and develop into strong individuals and leaders. Summer brings the five-week La Paz Kids Club, which provides enrichment activities for 125 neighborhood children and youth. La Paz House offers tutoring, homework help, bike repair training, a game room, and a healthy environment for our neighborhood students to hang out, grow, and learn. This offering gives us an opportunity to actively be involved in advocating for peace, justice, and equality in our community through supporting La Paz House. Thank you. Before we call ourselves to worship this morning, I'd like to um, take a moment to recognize graduates in our midst. I want to take a moment to formally recognize, um, formally recognize Blair Walker, who graduated this year from William Jewell College. Uh, we're proud of Blair's accomplishments. He's not currently here today. He's at Stillwell United Methodist Church, where he is serving as the choir director there. So we're excited for him being able to begin his career and move forward uh, as a choir director. 
You do also want to recognize a graduate who is here, Hunt Listrom, graduated from Park Hill South High School yesterday. Hunt, I'll have you come forward and please meet me in front of the communion table. You are taller than we first met. <laughs> so Hunt has graduated this year from Park Hill South High School. Um, Hunt is heading off to the University of Missouri, Columbia in the fall. You can see that lovely tiger patch there on his shirt. Um, Hunt will be majoring in economics. And I asked Hunt a question that I'm going to pose to all of you. So I asked Hunt a question before the worship service. I asked him, what are some things you're thinking about or what are some questions that you have as you head off to college? And he said, I'm thinking about how life will be structured differently, how there isn't necessarily gonna be a person over my shoulder telling me to go to class. And so I'm wondering if you all can think back to your own experiences of transitioning from high school to college, um, how did you deal with that? How did you deal with that change in the structure of your life? Anyone have any thoughts about that? Yes, Randy. Okay. Amen. Thank you, Randy. Yeah, so Randy lifts up that when he was headed off to college, he already had a sense of independence from camps and from being the oldest of four kids, but... Also, he had a good negative example in his first college roommate of uh, what happens if you stay up all night and what happens if you don't kind of hold yourself to that structure. Um, anyone else have a thought? Yeah, Don? Okay. Okay. Yeah, so Don lifts up that college was not necessarily an expectation for him growing up, and so he always recognized the privilege of it and the need to put academics first. Um, I'll go ahead and let my own answer be the last one, which is that um, at my college, um, it wasn't, at my college it was common for freshmen to join fraternities, and so I had the fraternity structure of we had an academic officer and that guy was going to make sure you were going to class. So uh, I know that you'll find your own answer and you'll find your way of, of being when you're there. I wanna to present to you this gift from the church. This is what I put in the inscription there, a grown-up book of faith for a grown-up person of faith. It's a book that really tackles, and it's a devotional that really tackles some deep questions of faith. And I hope that as you're heading off into an environment where you're gonna be managing your own faith and managing whether you go to church or not or whether you go to campus ministries or not, whether you talk about your faith or not, you're gonna be in charge of all that. And so I wanted you to have a hefty thing that would give you some answers when you have doubts, that would just be something that could help to, to strengthen you in that faith, just as you've grown kind of strong in body and strong in personhood. Let's take a moment and pray a prayer of commissioning over you as you head off for this, well, you're not heading off for a couple months, but we're gonna commission you anyway. Let's say a word of prayer. God, we give you thanks for Hunt. We give you thanks for all the ways that you have formed and shaped him, all the ways that you have been present with him. We pray that you will continue to watch over him, that you will guide his steps, that you will help him to find his way. 
And we ask this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you, Hunt. Let us call ourselves to worship. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich foods, a feast of well-matured wines, and he will destroy on this mountain the shroud cast over all peoples. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces. For the wall of death separating us from him, us from us, will disappear. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And the risen Christ calls us to love one another. But if this were an easy thing to do, we would not have to be commanded to do it. After all, kindness is easy. Most of us strive to be kind to everyone we meet. But love is another matter all together. Love requires time and energy. Love demands an investment of ourselves. Love is costly, and it often repays what we offer to it, but not always. Of course, as Easter people, we are called to live as though the costs are irrelevant as though the sacrifice is small in light of the death and resurrection of Christ. But still, we often fall short of this goal. When we fail to hold that resurrection faith and do not give as much of ourselves as we are called to give, we confess our sins, first using the prayer of confession in our bulletins, and then in a sacred moment of quiet prayer. Let us pray. Lord of life and Lord of love, you made the hearts of the disciples glad through the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. Forgive us because, like the disciples, we find the truth of the Easter hard to believe. We are easily downcast and given to despair. We claim to live by the resurrection faith, but we often believe suffering has no meaning and death is the end. Forgive us that we take so much convincing of the hope that you give to the world. Come to us, Lord God, in the power of the risen Christ, Take away our doubts and fears and bring us to life through your Holy Spirit. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And now, as forgiven children of God, at peace with God and each other, let us exchange signs of peace. Let us look each other in the eye, place our hands on our hearts, and greet one another in peace. May the peace of Christ be with you 
and also with you. Pulls forward for a time that's ju just for them. Good morning. Good morning, it's lovely to see you all. All right, so I wanted to tell you a story from scripture that's about a time when somebody had to go to someone else who they didn't think was their friend. Can you think of someone who in your life, maybe a classmate or maybe... Um, so. So you think Frankie's not a friend because he, he does what so much? Brag. He brags so much, okay. Yeah. Can, Henry, can you think of someone who's not a friend? Um, this kid called Evan, who's really uh, one of my favorite footballs over the fence. Evan, who threw one of your favorite footballs over the fence, yeah. okay. Yeah. Not that Evan. <laughs> okay. 
All right, so you have some idea of, you know, the people you're close to, the people you're friends with, maybe the people who you have a little bit more trouble with, people who you're a little less sure about, the people who Henry has Riley, who's a good friend. We're glad that he's here today. Who's your good friend, Malcolm? Esme and Micah, wonderful. Well, well, we are certainly glad that you are all here today, and we're glad that you are all our friends. But one day there was a man named Peter who was a follower of Jesus, and he had to go to a man named Cornelius who he didn't think would be a good friend of his. Because Peter and Cornelius were part of different groups. Peter was a Jewish person, and Cornelius was a Roman soldier. And Peter thought that anyone who was a Roman soldier couldn't be his friend. That anyone who was a Roman soldier would even be his enemy. Because the Romans and the Jews didn't get along with each other. And, but Peter was called by God to go to Cornelius. Hey, hey, Micah, Esme, Malcolm, I need quiet from you guys for two minutes. Yeah, it's probably because of uh, all the talking going on over here. So, so Peter was called to go to Cornelius. And Peter had to tell Cornelius the good news about Jesus had to tell him who Jesus was, what he was like, and see if Cornelius would believe in Jesus. And when Cornelius heard what Peter had to say, he was overjoyed. And he wanted to be a Christian, and he wanted to join Peter's group. And Peter was so surprised, because he didn't know that this person could be his friend. He just made the assumption that he couldn't. And so sometimes when we have those people who are close to us, who we're not sure about, those people who we don't quite know what to do with and who maybe we don't think of as our friends, sometimes when we show those people some love, when we pay them some attention and care for them, sometimes those people um, can show us a different part of themselves and can show us more of who God made them to be. Let's say a word of prayer if you all bow your heads. And repeat after me, dear God, thank you for your love. Help us to love others. Amen. All right, you can go back to your seats. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 17 through 47. This is a story about the early followers of Jesus, striving to discern what to do in a world where Christ has lived, Christ has died, Christ has risen, he is risen indeed. And now he has ascended into heaven and is no longer part of their daily physical reality. The early believers had received a mandate from Jesus in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 that they should be Christ's witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When our reading begins, the disciples have been witnessing to Christ in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria, and now it is time for them to reach out to the ends of the earth. In today's reading, we meet Cornelius a Roman military officer who is intrigued by the God of the Jewish people and a supporter of the local synagogue, but who is not himself Jewish. As our reading begins, Cornelius has seen a vision about the Apostle Peter and is preparing to welcome Peter into his home and hear a message about Jesus. For his part, Peter has his doubts about witnessing to a Roman centurion Peter is a faithful Jew who believes Jesus is God's Messiah, and he knows he's supposed to witness to Jesus to the ends of the earth. But does that mean spreading the word to people who aren't Jewish? To people who are ritually unclean? To people who eat impure foods and do not follow the God-given laws of the Jewish legal code? Could following Jesus to the ends of the earth really mean stepping out that far? Would Peter 
betray everything he thought he knew in order to witness to Jesus. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 17 through 47. Listen for the word of the Lord. Now, while Peter was greatly puzzled about what to make of the vision that he had seen, suddenly the, man, the men sent by Cornelius appeared. They were asking for Simon's house and were standing by the gate. They called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, Look, three men are searching for you. Now get up, go down, and go with them without hesitation, for I have sent them. So Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? They answered, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So Peter invited them in and gave them lodging. The next day he got up and went with the men, and some of the believers from Joppa accompanied him as well. The following day they came to Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. On Peter's arrival, Cornelius met him and, falling at his feet, worshipped Peter. But Peter made him get up, saying, Stand up, I am only a mortal. And as he talked with him, he went in and found out that many people had assembled. And Peter said to them, You yourselves know. You yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile, a person who is not Jewish. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. Now, may I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius replied, Four days ago, at this very hour, at three o'clock, I was praying in my house when suddenly a man in dazzling clothes stood before me. He said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying at the home of Simon a tanner by the sea. Therefore I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. So now all of us are here in the presence of God to listen to all that the Lord has commanded you to say. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel preaching peace by Jesus Christ. Jesus is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of God, the gift of the Holy Spirit, had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Holy wisdom, holy words. Thanks be to God. The United States is an increasingly pluralistic society. 
The U.S. population grew by 1.6 million people from 2018 to 2019, which is not an uncommon number for year-to-year -year population growth in our country. But it is notable that around one-third of that growth came from immigration. Between 1990 and 2020, the foreign-born population of the United States has more than doubled. Meanwhile, according to the 2020 census, the number of non-white people in the U.S. is growing, regardless of whether they are foreign-born or not. In 2020, more than 50% of children in the U.S. were identified with an ethnic group other than Caucasian. In 2020, more than half of the children in the U.S were identified with an ethnic group other than Caucasian. Meanwhile, mixed marriage race, mixed race marriages are increasing. More and more people identify themselves as more than one ethnic group. And so in the US, the color of our collective skin is beginning more and more to reflect the melting pot that we have always claimed America to be. Now, it's worth saying that some people in our society are threatened by these demographic changes. Recently, there was a shooting in Buffalo, New York, where a white gunman targeted people in a black neighborhood, and that gunman specifically cited white replacement theory as the motivation behind the shooting. He wanted to use his gun to reduce the black population because he had come to fear that if there were more of them, however you define them to be, if there were more of them, there would be less room for him and for people like him. Unfortunately, there are versions of white replacement theory all over our political discourse, versions of the idea that a rising foreign-born population or a rising non-white population is a threat to the rest of us, however you might define who us is. Often these ideas include some version of defining who is a real American and who is not. Who gets to count as one of us, or the people whose identity or way of life is supposedly under threat, and who counts as one of them, the other whose existence or whose rhetoric supposedly threatens the real Americans. In the wake of the shooting in Buffalo and other acts of violence that stem from similar ideas, we must say unequivocally that Christians condemn white replacement theory and anything that looks like it. As the Apostle Paul proclaimed in the early days of the Christian faith, in Christ there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female. Through Christ, the artificial lines we draw between people, through Christ, the artificial lines we draw between people are wiped away and there is no reason for us to label anyone as real Americans or real anything, any more than we can label someone else as false or say that they do not belong. In Christ, all people belong. And the answer to any question we have about any other person or group of people is love. Love is our first and final answer. For the Apostle Peter in our reading, this was a lesson that he was beginning to learn. Peter, like most of the other early followers of Jesus, is a faithful Jew, a person who believes that Jesus is the Messiah who was sent by God to fulfill the Jewish prophecies. Peter knows he is called to proclaim the good news about Jesus in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, but surely he must have thought this mandate can only extend to other Jews. Surely he must have thought his charge was to proclaim Jesus to all the other Jews who were scattered to the ends of the earth. Surely he must have thought in the beginning non-Jewish people were not included in the mandate because non-Jewish people lived in violation of God's laws. The laws in the Hebrew scriptures, the collection of books that we call the Old Testament, the laws in the Hebrew scriptures were handed down by God and they contained a number of laws defining who was and who was not part of God's people, a number of laws about what God's people eat and what they wear and how they act. Gentiles or non-Jewish people violated those laws every day. Even the God-fearing Gentiles like Cornelius, the God-fearing Gentiles who hung around the synagogues and learned about the Jewish God, even they were every day violators of God's law. 
And how could God's Messiah be proclaimed to people who were actively violating God's law? However, Peter learned. He learned. From his experience with Cornelius and other people at the ends of the earth, Peter learned. He had a vision where God showed him that all foods were clean. All foods were pure for people to eat. And by extension, that meant all people were clean as well. All people were pure in the eyes of God. He learned that when Jesus asked him to witness to Christ to the ends of the earth, he was asking Peter to not just go to a physical location that was farther away than he had ever been. When Jesus told him to proclaim Christ to the ends of the earth, the ends of the earth is not just a physical place that is far away, it is also a spiritual place, an emotional place. It is also a place for for Peter to expand his mind, to open his heart. The ends of the earth are not just a physical place, they are a spiritual and emotional place where we see people we have not seen before and we love them in new ways that stretch us outside of our comfort zones. Now, having heard that, you may say that in our church, we do this very well. We're living into this mandate. In our church, we love everyone. In our church, everyone is welcome and everyone belongs. And I do believe that the circle is wider here than it is in most churches. And that we are very much moving in the direction that God is calling us to go. But I also know that all people sin and fall short of the glory of God. And that on this side of the kingdom of God, all of us have room to grow. Consider for a moment the subject of race. In our nation, people of all races have the opportunity to thrive, and that is reflected in the changing demographics I mentioned earlier. That tide of people who are coming to take advantage of opportunities, that group of people who are coming to strive for something better here, they recognize that this is a place where people of all races have the opportunity to thrive. Since the life and tragic death of Martin Luther King Jr., we have made extraordinary progress as a nation, but that progress is not reflected in most of our churches. Seventy years ago, Dr. King lamented that the church hour was the most segregated hour in in the United States. And today, when so many other things have changed, one might think that church would have changed too, but it hasn't. Most churches today, including ours, are primarily composed of people of one race or another. Most churches are not the kind of melting pot that we strive to be as a nation. Most churches are not able to fully embrace a multicultural identity where there is large representation of different kinds of groups of people. Now, there are some exceptions to this. I think about Oakhurst Presbyterian Church in Decatur, Georgia, which is a church that I used to work at when I was in seminary. I think of the Church of All Nations in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is another powerfully multicultural congregation. In both of these churches, they have been intentional about creating multicultural communities. They have a huge amount of diversity, and they've worked very hard to get there. They have adopted new styles of worship, to make new groups of people more comfortable. They have shaped their buildings to reflect the diversity they seek. They have sponsored in-depth racial dialogues to dig down deep, to talk to each other with honesty, to go in depth and be present with each other in a way that honors every part of who they are and every experience they have had. Now, in our church, diversity is welcome. People of all races will be greeted warmly People are welcome, but are we willing to make the kinds of tangible, in-depth changes that it would require to foster a truly multicultural community? Will we go out of our way to reach out beyond our comfort zones and welcome people of all races with a deeper depth of welcome, or will we say that the status quo is enough? 
Consider the LGBT population, a group whose numbers are on the rise in the United States. At PPC, we are welcoming of, all, of LGBT people. We may have a diversity of views about same-gender marriage and what the Bible says on that topic, but we agree that all people are welcome. Even if we have a diversity of opinions, we agree about welcoming people. Any LGBT person who comes here will be greeted warmly, but they will be most comfortable if they look and sound like the people who are already here, if they are college educated, if they don't speak with a lisp, if they don't express their gender in a way that startles us or makes us uncomfortable. In fact, I know of a young man who used to worship in this congregation, a man who many people would call effeminate, if we're falling back into the gender stereotypes that the Holy Spirit called us to abandon in Galatians 3.28. I know of a young man who used to worship in this congregation, a man who many people would call effeminate, who overheard a member of this church referring to him as a freak. So LGBT people are welcome here, but will they feel comfortable if something about them makes us uncomfortable? And how about the poor? The poor are welcome here. They will be warmly greeted if they come to church here, but many do not even try to do so. They see us and make the assumption that they will not fit in, that their clothing won't be good enough to match the clothes of the people who drive the Lexuses out in the parking lot, that their way of speech and the concerns that dominate their lives will be so different from everyone else's that they could never really be themselves in this space. Even among people who do give us a try, I know of two families who no longer worship here because they did not feel that they fit in, because they did not think they were middle class enough or upper class enough to feel like they belonged here. Now, I'm not saying any of this to chide us. I'm not saying this to make us feel bad. I'm saying this because we're already on the right track, because we strive to be warm and welcoming and all-inclusive, because for the most part, we get it, and we are trying to have a broader tent, and we do, in fact, have a broader tent than most churches. But we're not perfect. Any church, like any human being, has room to grow. Until we can credibly claim, until we can credibly claim to be just like Jesus, we have room to grow. And these are our growing edges. These are some of the things we can address if we want to go to where the Apostle Peter went, to the ends of the earth, recognizing that the ends of the earth are not just a physical location, but an emotional and spiritual one a sight of open hearts and open minds where we fully live the words that we proclaim each week. If we are called to go to the ends of the earth, if we are called to stretch ourselves beyond our comfort zones and foster a space of true belonging for all people, then let us continue to work. Let us continue to strive to be a place where everyone is loved and everyone belongs. And I mean really belongs. Comfortably, comfortably belongs, belongs with every fiber of their being and every part of who they are. Let us go with Jesus to the ends of the earth. Amen.
come now to a time of prayer. What do we have to lift up to God today? What joys and concerns would we lift up in prayer? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. So our official vacation Bible school is Saturday, June 4th. It'll be an all-day event this year. But we had a kickoff today in Sunday school to have an initial lesson, an initial foray into what the Knights of the North Castle is all about. And so we're thankful for all the volunteers who are part of that, all the volunteers who are going to be part of that, um, and that beautiful moment in the life of our church. Uh, Henry? Henry is thankful that his friend Riley got to be with us and to learn about God with us today. So praise God for that. Are there other prayer requests to lift up or joys to lift up? Yes, Mike? So there's a lot of really good things happening in Parkville Presbyterian Church. Yeah. And here in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a special meeting with our Okay. And we'll talk about it more sixth. June fifth. June fifth. Yeah. June fifth. We'll have nominating forms and all that kind of stuff, but we uh, we just need your prayers right now. Amen. Mike Vaughn makes the request to lift up the nominating committee in prayer. That committee consists of Mike Vaughn, Jan Myers, Pam Creer, and Mary Listrom. Uh, we pray for that group as they go about their nominating work this year, that they will find the people who are called by God to serve in leadership in the church, um, and that they will initiate a beautiful process of bringing people into a place of serving God more deeply. Um, Mike did lift up that there are many wonderful things happening in the church. Uh, did we have a speak drive through yesterday? Was that yesterday? Okay. So... I don't suppose you know any numbers off the top of your head. Okay. Okay, wow. Okay. So, yes. Okay. Okay. So we want to continue to pray for the work of our Speak Food Pantry. Uh, the third Saturday of the month, they have a drive-through event. We know that they served we we know that they served a hundred boxes of food yesterday, um, and we know that there were further vouchers that were given out for people to come back later uh, to get food at a different time. Um, Linda also lifted up that Speak is now serving people in all of Platte County and not just Southern Platte County, and so that's an expanded footprint and more people to serve and more people to love through that ministry. So we praise God for that, and we pray for that. Uh, what else might we lift up this morning, Carrie? Yeah. So for the break time event on Friday, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Parkville Living Center break time is the third Friday of each month, 6 to 8 p.m., free dinner, free child care. I know in our family with our four-year-old and seven-year-old, we enjoy that, and we're very thankful for it. So. Um, we love for others to come and to enjoy that as well. Um, and then Carrie also lifted up that uh, we have a little girl who turned four this week, and so we praise God for Esme's birthday. All right. Anything else we should lift up this morning? Yes, Joyce? Okay. Joyce, Joyce McDonald's son-in-law is serve, uh, just graduated from Karis Bible College. 
um, and he'll be serving in ministry um, alongside his wife, who's also serving in ministry. And so we give thanks for both of them and for the work that they do. Any others? Susan Heim Davis, we want to pray for. She's having a rough patch in her health. Um, you may notice we haven't seen her for the past few weeks, and she you know, hasn't been able to make the journey to be here on Sunday morning. So we want to pray for her to be revived in health and to get back to that level of, of being herself and for strength and for healing. Are there others? Let us continue in prayer. God, we give you thanks for gathering us together and thanks for the gifts you give us each day. We pray that you would watch over us, that you would help us to love one another as you call us to love one another, that you would help us to love the world as you call us to love our neighbor. Help us to expand our sense of possibility. Help us to expand our awareness of your call and our courage to be where you call. We pray for the many people in our lives who are in need of healing and strength and recovery, for the many people who are not thinking about your call because they are thinking about their health, about their strength, about their needs. And so we pray that you would fill them up, that you would accompany them, that you would restore them, that you would walk alongside them and help them to feel the comfort of your presence. We give you thanks for the many signs all around us that you are at work, for graduations and for good things happening, for mission work being done, for people gathering together in community. We give you thanks for the many ways in which we see you at work and know you are at work. Help us to continue to see your presence all around us so that in those moments of need, in those moments of uncertainty, that in those moments, too, we may have the eyes to see you and the ability to know your presence and your comfort. Lord, we give you thanks for all of who you are. We give you thanks for guiding us and directing us. And we pray that you will continue to lead us forward. In your son's name, amen. On the Thursday before the Sunday, when he rose again, Jesus was having supper with his closest friends. During a moment in that meal, he lifted up a loaf of bread, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. As often as you share bread together, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took a cup and poured it out, and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in the substance of my life. As often as you share this cup together, remember me. Jesus gave us this meal to help us to know him more fully, to help us to see him more clearly, to help us to know his presence, and then to seek his presence in the world around us, in other people, in scripture, and in all of the places where God is. Through this meal, we begin to see, we begin to be filled by the Jesus who is here everywhere. You may come forward at this time.
Let us pray. Lord of life and Lord of love, your love is overwhelming and abundant. Your grace knows no bounds. Help us as your resurrection people to live with overwhelming, abundant, and boundless love. Help us to give ourselves to others. Help us to be more like you. We pray these things in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, God is at work in Parkville Presbyterian Church. Through missions such as the Speak Food Pantry and Hillcrest Transitional Housing, we support people in need and offer them love. Through ministries such as Vacation Bible School and Confirmation, we form kids in faith and help them grow in the light of God's love. Through our music program, we show love to one another and offer our gifts in love to the world. We invite you to support these labors of love through gifts of time, talent, energy, and presence. You can also support our ministries through financial gifts placed in the offering plate outside the sanctuary or through one of the other means indicated in your bulletin. However you give and whatever you give, may all our gifts of time, talent, love, and resources be blessed for growing the kingdom of God. Let us rise in body or in spirit as we worship God one more time.
Let us go forth and be God's people here on Main Street and in Parkville and to the ends of the earth. Amen.